Okay, Prinam Da, good afternoon everybody. We're just going to begin the session now, as we should have most people with us. We have over 380 people booked on with us today, which is amazing to see so much interest in this topic. So bear with us one moment and we'll just begin shortly. Okay, so my name is Lauren. I work for Camp Life as a support officer on the Magnificent Meadows Cymru project. Um, we're funded by Welsh Government and we work across Wales on the creation of wildflower meadows from national trust sites to schools, hospitals, and bringing people to these beautiful sites through a range of events and engagement activities. Part of our project is also delivering a wide range of training, including workshops on meadow making, plant identification, and also working on various different partners on managing meadows for wildlife. We're delighted to be here today. Um, and as part of the Spring Into Action programme, we'll share a link to the full programme events on offer in the chat shortly. And next week, we are running a rapid grassland assessment webinar, and we'll also be running field workshops um, in the summer related to this. So in addition, um, as part of Magnificent Meadows Cymru project, we have a number of online and in-person events coming up, including sessions on meadow making, winter grazing in partnership with Pont, a session in partnership with Bug Life on insects and pollinators, and managing meadow for reptiles um, and amphibians in partnership with ARC. So we'll share um, some more information about these um, shortly. So um, I'd just like to uh, introduce our two panelists for today. So we have Ollie Watson and we have Lucia Shimarova. Um, would you both like to put your cameras on and um, I can introduce you both. Okay, uh, so Ollie Watson um, is the National Plant Monitoring Scheme's Ecological Modeler for Plant Life. Um, he's a biogeographer bio bio interested in environmental change through space and time with an MSc in Ethnobotany and a degree in Biological Sciences. And he's just come into the end of a PhD in Environmental Science at the University of Reading. And Lucia is the Conservation Officer for Magnificent Meadows Cymru. She gives advice on how to create and restore species-rich meadows and trains others in all aspects of meadow management and monitoring. She's an entomologist with a degree in wildlife conservation and a has a degree in ecological and environmental management. So just a little bit about today's session. We've got about an hour uh, for the presentations and that will include some time to answer any questions that um, you may have for us. If you have any questions, please could you pop them in the Q&A feature um, just because it's a bit easier for us to um, keep note of them at the end. Um, so on a technical side, we'll be putting links to things that we're mentioning today in the chat feature, um, things to online resources and things that we mention. Unfortunately, I don't think it's possible to download the chat afterwards, so if you want to save any of the links, please copy and paste them. And if there's anything that you've sort of missed from today, do feel free to get in touch with us via email and we can send that across. Um, if you've got any questions, as I mentioned, use the Q&A um, feature. Uh, and if there's any problems in terms of technical problems, again, pop them in the chat for us and we'll see what we can do. Um, lastly, the session is being recorded um, and it'll be available on YouTube afterwards. So if you're currently watching us on YouTube, hello, um, you won't be able to view the chat, but you'll be able to hear the Q&A at the end of this session. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Lucia, who's going to begin her presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Um, as Laura mentioned, we are talking about uh, grassland monitoring today. It seems like it's a hot topic these days. So amazing to see over 200 people with us. Uh, so I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction. Then Oli will jump in, uh, say, say a few bits about specific uh, monitoring techniques, and then I'll finish off. Um, so just starting off uh, with what are actually meadows, because this is all about uh, monitoring in our meadows, uh, gardens, grasslands. Um, meadows, meadows seems to be, it's a bit of a colloquial term as well. So it's uh, not as easy to define as people might think. Um, meadows were in the past um, kind of officially 
really meant as hay meadows. That would be what the term meadow uh, would be referring to. But these days, there is all sorts of different habitats. We also clump under meadows. We could have mini meadows in our gardens, meadows on our roadside verges, or we have pastures with animals. Um, but these uh, pictures in this slide kind of show you a bit of a difference with what, what people do sometimes consider as meadows. Uh, so the picture on your right hand side um, are some of these really kind of showy, colorful um, flowers that you might have seen around uh, your roadside veggies that councils plant often and um, in, in the roundabout. These, in fact, are not actually meadows. They often are uh, referred to as pictorial, pictorial or designer meadows. They are actually a um, collections of individual cornfield annual flowers. So these would be traditionally found uh, around fields and they really need that um, regular disturbance to be able to seed because they're annuals, they have to seed every year into bare ground. So traditionally uh, they would be uh, found in areas that were plowed. Uh, so they really uh, take advantage of this disturbance and sow into bare ground. So you see them poppies around the fields of the margins are in between rows of uh, arable um, crops. Uh, whereas it's very hard to keep it like that um, when you are in this setting, when you've got a big, thick um, areas of them. So what tends to actually happen is uh, councils often then would remove these areas completely and have to resow them every year, which is not very sustainable and also not very cheap way of doing it. Um, these um, mixes can sometimes also have plants from other countries, um, which is not, not that great for the kind of local uh, genetics uh, and also don't have very many grasses in them. So um, the individual flowers do have some value and space uh, in time, but uh, this is not what we call meadows as ecologists. So when we talk about meadows, it's something that looks like more like on your left. Um, you can see that they can be just as colorful, but the main difference is that most of these uh, flowers that you find in our uh, native meadows are perennials, which means that you only need to go through the sowing process once. And once you do that, they are established and they will stay there. So the only way to kind of manage them is by doing the right uh, mowing and cutting at the right times. So it's a very nice and sustainable way of also creating new meadows that we've lost. Um, and you can also see the proportion in these uh, native meadows with uh, wildflowers and grasses. There is, uh, in fact, more grasses than wildflowers. And grasses are an extremely important component of, of this habitat because loads of loads of insects depend on grasses. Um, so they are meant to be there. Just a bit about why uh, are we talking about meadows? Um, what's good about them? Why should we care? Why should we bring them back? Um, well, they are incredible for wildlife. They are, in fact, uh, when they are managed well, can be one of our most diverse habitats that we've got in the UK. Um, the amazing diversity of flowers, if you can bring those into your meadow, will in turn uh, support amazing diversity of insects that depend on them and lots of other wildlife that will use the meadows, whether that's for nesting or breeding or resting, mating. Um, there is lots of birds, reptiles um, and other wildlife that will use meadows. And you can also see lots of uh, really amazing grassland fungi there. Uh, meadows are also coming a bit more to the forefront uh, when we are having wider con conservation uh, conversations. They have been kind of undervalued in this sense and not as analyzed uh, as woodlands, but it's it's becoming a bit clearer that they actually uh, also have a really big role to play in this. Um, so the small table that you can see with the figures there, that's talking about below ground carbon storage. Uh, when we are talking above ground, woodlands are still uh, by far the best, but talking about below ground carbon storage, actually the uh, unimproved grasslands, which means that they haven't been plowed or fertilized for a long time, not disturbed, they actually can hold just as much carbon as woodlands. Um, not even talking about our well-being. Um, if if any of you have ever been sitting or standing or walking through a an amazing species rich meadow with orchids in, uh, it's just absolutely incredible. You can just see and hear all the buzzing around you. It's a, it's a really amazing place to be. And also they are very important components of our farming um, um, landscape. 
uh, there are also studies coming up about uh, various different um, advantages of having species um, different wild uh, flowers in your hay which are really good for for minerals they can um, mean that your animals might not take as many antibiotics or uh, not uh, many kind of warming treatments so there are also kind of health benefits to animals just a bit about meadows as a habitat and how they kind of evolved and where they are sitting so you can see this uh, kind of a timeline of what we call ecological succession and uh, this is basically the uh, evolution of how um, habitats will occur in a, in a certain place so we kind of start with these annual plants uh, at the beginning because they really take advantage of that uh, bare ground and the disturbance. Once those gaps close a bit, they are not able to seed. Uh, they get overtaken a bit more by perennial plants and grasses. This is where our meadows sit. Uh, if we don't do anything um, with this habitat and just leave it untouched, you will soon have these fields colonized by shrubs like brambles, hawthorn. Uh, and again, if you leave it for a couple of decades, few decades, this will eventually naturally turn into a woodland, which in our temperate region would be the kind of beach oak woodlands. Uh, so in the past, uh, meadows would be surviving in the kind of more uh, dis naturally disturbed areas or areas where trees couldn't really grow. And this would be on very thin soils, on rocky outcrops, uh, verges of ponds and uh, lakes, for example. Um, and really would be kind of encouraged by these big herbivores that were roaming free around like this auroch there, or actually hippopotamus I was reading was very important in spreading our meadow plants. And then a bit later on, when uh, we started creating developments and moving around, clearing a bit more land, this is when the meadows really kind of took advantage of that and increased in extent. So these days we don't have as much of these kind of uh, traditional pressures, um, but um, what's important to know that we sometimes refer to meadows as the kind of semi-natural habitat because they do need our interference, they need ongoing management, otherwise they will just turn into scrub and woodland. Uh, so these days it is mostly done either by cutting, by lawnmowers or bigger machines or by grazing. Just a tiny bit about very general um, rules about managing meadows. It, um, you can kind of see these two um, annual wheels. The one on the left talks about larger scale meadows that are managed by grazing or hay cutting. And the ones on the right hand side is more about your mini meadows in your gardens. But both of those are very similar in terms of that you can see between April and July. So those untouched we want to let them to the flower and set seed and then we want to cut them over the winter so that's generally the management of the meadows and whether you do it by a lawnmower or a scythe or you put animals back on to graze uh, there are just different ways of managing it Um, there are a few different types of meadows as well. Um, as I mentioned before it's not uh, the definitions are not not as, as easy there is um, I think the national vegetation classification has got at least 23 different communities of dry meadows. But what we tend to generally uh, div uh, kind of divide them by is a pH in their soil that gives rise to the three main types of meadows that we uh, tend to talk about, which is acid grassland, neutral grassland and calcareous grassland. And as you can see from the pictures, they all look pretty different. They've got very, because they've got different soil, the, the different building blocks are giving rise to very different communities of flowers in, and different species. So the neutral grasslands are the ones that you might know um, kind of most. Um, the more traditional box daisies, red clovers, whereas the acid grassland uh, with the beautiful rag drop in there, uh, they tend to be um, a bit less species rich and they also are often found either on kind of marshy areas they can be wet or in then in the very uplandy areas where you are kind of almost changing there into heathlands and then we've got calcareous grasslands which are the most species rich of all the different types of grasslands and one of the species most species rich habitats in the uk as well and these are quite characteristics uh, for th very thin soils on limestone very free draining uh, and plants like wild thyme and wild marjoram. Then we also tend to um, divide meadows uh, by um, how 
much they have been changed in the past, basically how much they've been tempered with. Um, so if you've got um, meadows that haven't been ploughed or fertilized um, uh, or sprayed with, uh, with any herbicides, then we tend to call them unimproved. Um, and that's the, the ones that tend to be very, very species rich. On the other hand, we've got the improved grassland that you can see the picture there, which tend to have almost a um, very, very limited amount of diversity in terms of flowers there, because they would have been changed from the original ancient those into um, more of an uh, either arable or a more commercially used land for uh, making silage and feeding to animals. Um, just a bit of a state so i'm only i'm talking for wales uh, wales here you can see on the map um, the kind of extent of loss of our meadows um in 1930s the all the greens and yellows are those the kind of the unimproved grasslands that i mentioned that haven't been um uh, kind of um you know covered in uh, herbicides or fertilizers or plowed and changed into something else and uh, the one on the right is what it's kind of looking like now, really. So we have lost 90% of our flower meadows in um, Wales. And I think it's something like 97 in England. So yeah, the most of our grasslands are now looking like the, um, the improved grassland picture that you saw, just kind of plain green, uh, just filled full of grass, not very many wildflowers. And there are kind of few main uh, reasons why this happened um, throughout our history. The biggest hit really, uh, and the more meadows we lost was um, during the wars. Um, there were massive incentives going around for people that had any kind of wild land, which was actually called wasteland then, uh, anything that wasn't used for um, agricultural production for creating food was was waste. Uh, so at, in those times, we lost most of our ancient woodlands as well, heathlands, um, hedgerows were ripped out, and of course meadows because they are so accessible. They were already flat uh, fields. They were the the ones that really were damaged the most uh, in terms of being able. It was just the easiest to really plow up a. Uh, field that was already flat and accessible rather than ripping out woodlands, which also happened. Um, and then a bit later on, just the kind of, I guess, natural um, evolution in our technology as well. We really shifted from the use of um, traditional hay cutting uh, techniques into um, a huge productive fields of having as much grass growing as possible and cutting throughout the year, which means that the um, flowers just don't have chance to uh, to set seed really. And, and also the modern technology means that we are just super efficient now. So we've increased a kind of use of artificial fertilizers and herbicides and before it was kind of you know applied by hand there would always be some areas that would survive whereas now uh, all of these machines are so efficient that we um, you know put the gps in and the fields are sprayed up to the very margin so there is not very much uh, space there for those wildflowers to survive um but i kind of quite like to flip this argument as well around and um we do have most most of our land looks like uh, the green fields at the, at the moment, but really that also um, brings a bit of a potential there and we've got lots of um, chances to try and turn all of these fields. Uh, so we know that most of our landscape is grassland and anything that's grassy and green, it can be lawns, it can be um, you know spaces in front of your offices or um, around your hospitals, any of these uh, mown grassy areas can be turned into meadows. Um, so kind of going into the monitoring um, topic now, uh, whatever your, your meadow is, um, whether it's a garden or it's a hay meadow, or if you are only just starting your meadow making journey, or if you're already in it and you just need a bit more of a boost, uh, starting thinking about monitoring your meadow and how how your creation is going might be a good idea. So um, why would we normally monitor our meadows and grasslands? There are the various different reasons. Uh, 
depends on what you want out of it as well. Uh, but um, often we tend to monitor to find out what, what's actually there in the first place. If you don't know what kind of grassland you've got, uh, you will be able to tell by the um, species that occur there to be able to say, have you got an acid grassland? Have you got a neutral grassland? Um, probably the one of the most relevant ones for some of these techniques is whether your management is actually working are you when you just started creating your meadow is what you are doing working is your diversity increasing or decreasing that's that's the very common question that we we would be asking um you can also monitor for some specific species uh, monitoring will often also show you if you've got any problem species there that you might not want there um, or if you're introducing specific species into your meadow uh, like Devil's Bit Scabies, for example, that's a food plant of a heath fritillary butterfly um, that's often kind of um, specially planted into meadows. How is that going? Um, and just in general, how is your grassland changing over a long period of time? So we've got, and there are quite a few different monitoring techniques that already exist. Um, some of these will require more knowledge than others. So with national vegetation classification, for example, um, you pretty much need to be a botanist to be able to um, carry out these because they are asking for quite a detailed uh, description of all the different species and you might be able to you might need to be able to identify grasses as well, for example. So yeah, every monitoring technique is slightly different and requires different um, knowledge. Uh, you can also monitor by just doing frequent pictures as well, for example, that gives you an idea of something. But we will be today talking about the three techniques that uh, plant life uh, is using to monitor um, meadows and mini meadows as well which is the every flower counts um, rapid grassland assessment and national plant monitoring scheme. So just a bit of a background into what monitoring actually means. What is it? Um, so you might have heard about doing a survey, which is uh, generally tends to be uh, just a species list. So you maybe walk through your area and just note down what flowers you can see. And it just tends to be maybe done once or kind of randomly, which so it's it's good to, to have that. That's a really good way to start. Uh, but what it doesn't show you uh, is the kind of change over time uh, and the abundance frequencies of those species. So you might have a list of 15 species um, that you came up with, but actually one of them one individual and some of them were super common so if you only have a list of species it doesn't tell you that um, and also often it doesn't include any habitat characteristics whereas if we talk about monitoring um, we tend to then talk about um, it in sense is a repeated survey but it's repeated uh, on regular basis and with specific aims so um, examples of monitoring would be the two monitoring techniques that we will be talking about. Um, and this uh, and monitoring will show you change over time. It will also show you abundance of species. And often it comes with uh, spaces to write a lot about your habitat characteristics as well. So it tends to um, come with templates. Um, like the screenshot you can see there, every monitoring again will have slightly different templates. But what's a really good thing about monitoring really that's the, the strengths about it are that you are you will start collecting robust data which can then be used in your scientific studies or in anything else if you needed to you know have a complaint about something or you are, or you are fighting for this piece of uh, grassland that's there and you don't want it to be built on uh, you will need to have some kind of a proof so this is what monitoring can also be used for um, it is important to stick with the same method so once you decide on a method stick with it uh, because then that means that you will be able to compare it across different years and if you are using the same method on different sites you can also compare it across sites Um, so when we talk about monitoring, um, it often kind of involves these kind of three elements in it. So often you will be looking at quantifying your coverage of plants in some way. This can be done in different ways. Um, just very briefly, the simplest one is you are talking about presence absence. So look in your square and say, is my is red clover present? Um, and you simply just say yes or no. Um, 
Then day four um, it stands for dominant, abundant, frequent, uh, occasional, and rare. Yeah. <laughs> As, and often, uh, once you have got answers for your presence absence, they can be translated into the frequency. So you will then find out whether your red, red clover was uh, rare or was frequent around your site. And domin, uh, again, slightly in um, your plants, you are looking at percentage cover. So you will look at the specific species uh, and kind of um, calculate in your head how much of the of the ground cover that species um, covers. And again, it's kind of divided into specific categories. Um, all of these techniques are very often based on uh, looking at positive and negative plant indicators. So we are often not looking at every single plant that we've got in our meadow, but I'll touch on that a bit later. Um, I mentioned that um, monitoring often also includes habitat characteristics. This could be things like looking at a ratio of your flowers to grasses, which is an important part of your meadow because you are aiming for having quite a lot of uh, flowers uh, to your grasses. Then you also can be looking at how much scrub there is because that can indicate you might have a bit of a problem. Uh, you might remove, need to remove this scrub uh, if you don't want to lose your meadow. How much leaf litter there is? Uh, what is the extent of your background? Because this might actually um, indicate that you might have too many animals on your land and they are overgrazing your meadow. Uh, with um, all of these techniques, um, they all might have slightly different methodologies, but very often with static things like plants, you would use quadrats uh, to calculate your um, qu uh, frequency of your plants. Um, they can be of different sizes. They can be a one by one meter squared or five by five, for example. If you are talking about more linear features like hedgerows or waterways, uh, there you tend to then place linear plots. Um, there can be also different transects. So this is quite often the case for moving things. Like if you are doing insect um, surveying, you tend to have a um, one kilometer transect that you walk or a time transect you would, you would walk for an hour and, and record all the different uh, insects. So within your plots, there are couple of main ways of how you can place your plots and all three of the techniques that we are talking about today uh, include the uh, include these uh, tr plots uh, and squares uh, so you either have fixed squares uh, which large um, this one is five by five meters square this is what the national plan monitoring scheme uses and because they are fixed in one place they then they uh, you only place them once you uh, have your coordinate reading, place your square, and then you repeat the same area every year. Um, so it's uh, survey repeated in the same spot. And on the other hand, you've got the kind of random uh, selection, randomized squares. Um, they tend to then be a bit smaller because you do loads more of them. So you have one by one meter square that is used by both every flower counts and rapid grassland assessment technique. And this then kind of comes down to the basic uh, scientific principles. So the more squares um, you place around your field, the more accurate your data will be. Uh, so the total minimum for any kind of scientific study you want is three squares because that's where you can do average, but it might not give you such a such a great representation really. So we are we tend to say with rapid grassland assessment aiming for 20 to 30 uh, squares on your land. Um, and again, um, there are some techniques that are being used for that. Uh, quite a common one is what we call W uh, walk across your field. So you kind of walk in a pattern of W across your field and you place your squares there. So you kind of have a really good spread around your field. And these can change, these kind of change every year. So they are not fixed into the, the same spot every year. I mentioned the use of um, indicators to uh, carry out your monitoring. And um, this, is some, this is a technique um, that is being used all across um, uh, the whole of the kind of 
ecological fields really. Um, ideally, you might um, want to do a full species list for, for your site if you can do it, but we know that that's often not possible because you need to be quite a good botanist to be able to do that. And also it might not be necessary. So what often um, um, happens in ecology is that uh, we use subset of these species that can then kind of tell us um, a bit about the condition of the habitat. Um, and these are called indicators. So for example, um, this happens in freshwater ecology as well. If you are trying to you're looking at a very specific group of insects, which are called caddis flies. And just by looking at those, you can then kind of extrapolate um, to know whether your condition is in a good or a poor state so in the very same way we are using a subset of uh, wildflowers that uh, we, are, we are looking at in our meadows to kind of find out whether the condition is good, good or poor and these tend to be flowers that that are it's a mixture of flowers that can be very common but also the ones that might be quite rare because they are the ones that are responding really well or the ones that really hate fertilizer for example so you know if that flower is not there it's something is happening um, and these, these can also be divided often into positive and negative indicators. So with uh, positive and negative indicators, um, there are a few examples here. For example, our beds for trefoil or yellow rattle is a really good indicator in our hay meadows. So we know that the, the meadow is um, kind of shaping up nicely if they start appearing. Wild thyme again, a really good positive indicator of good quality calcareous grassland. And then on the other hand, we've got what we call negative indicators. These are these tend to be the kind of weedy problem species that we find. They are themselves not bad plants at all, and we are not trying to eliminate them. We know that they have got amazing um, value for wildlife. I think creeping thistle or is it spear thistle is one of the top 10 nectar uh, producing plants um, for our pollinators. So they, they can be amazing plants, but it does mean that if we do have loads of them in our meadows, it does mean that it might make the management of our meadows might become quite difficult because they do tend to dominate. And also they, they tend to um, kind of indicate again uh, that something might be going on with your soil so often having lots of nettle might mean that you actually have quite a lot of nutrients in your soil or, or if you have lots of creeping plants like and up that means that your soil might be compacted so they might also be telling you something that's that's happening down below but generally when we are doing monitoring we are aiming for um increasing the number of um our positive neg uh, positive indicators and decreasing the number of the negative indicators. And also we are looking at spread. So we, we want uh, them to increase in number, but also we want them to be spread more uh, and more evenly around our meadow as well. So that was kind of um, general rules and introduction into what meadow actually is and what it generally involves. But again, as I said, uh, different techniques are going to have slightly different methods. Um, and now we are going to tell you a bit more about the three individual um, methods that we use uh, in plant life. And Oli is going to start with every flower count. Lovely. Thank you very much. You see, I'm just going to do a little bit of admin and hopefully I can move some slides around now. Um, so as you just heard, my name is Oli. Uh, I usually work on the National Plants Monitoring Scheme, um, but uh, for now I'm going to be talking about not only that, but also plant life's, one of plant life's other uh, meadow mon or grassland monitoring schemes, which is Every Flower Counts. Um, let's see if I can move this slide along. Hmm. Um, we'll hope it moves along in just a second. Um, if it doesn't, Lucia, you might have to move it on for me. Um, so every flower counts is kind of at the more accessible end of the monitoring schemes you're going to hear about in the next uh, few minutes. It is a very accessible, really quite straightforward survey that you can do with kids, with family members, you could potentially do it at a school, and it happens at two points uh, every year. It happens in sort of late May, very beginning of June, and 
kind of mid July ish designed to capture early flowering seasons and late flowering seasons of some of the most important plants for pollinators that you might find in your lawns. Now we've managed to avoid defining exactly what lawns are in this survey, which I think is quite a smart move, but essentially you can do it certainly in your front or your back gardens, you might want to do it on um, grass in a community park, um, essentially any, I think is any kind of domesticated grassland area, but there is no reason why this couldn't also be applied to a wilder, more meadow-like area as well. Fundamentally, um, you get a result called your personal nectar score, which gives an impression of roughly how many bees. Uh, previously, we've looked at honeybees, though this year we're hoping to branch out to give some more numbers for maybe solitary bees uh, and for bumblebees. How many of those bees could your garden support based on how large your garden is and how many flowers you find in it? Um, it is a fantastic engagement event. Um, it's tied in, especially in the early part of the year, with um, a lot of publicity and a lot of events for Plant Life does about No Mo May, designed to try and increase the biodiversity of people's lawns. And it is really quite a straightforward thing. Um, sorry, I've missed a... There we are. Um, it is a very straightforward survey. You essentially have to put semi-randomly some one by one meter squares in your lawn um, in the survey periods. We encourage people to do it semi-randomly. Most people do two or three, uh, but you could if you wanted to do up to 20 of them. Um, you count the number of flower heads of different species. We've narrowed it down to, I think there are 26 across the two survey periods. You count the number of flowers from each of those different plants, submit your results online, and then you get yourself your personal nectar score that gives you an impression of roughly how many insect pollinators your garden could support. And then there are also different resources to tell you a little bit about how you can improve that result, how you could make um, your nectar score go up. So this year, uh, I think I'm allowed to tell you, but I will tell you anyway, the survey is opening on the 21st of May. Uh, and it's going to run through till the 30th of May in the first instance. It is super helpful and super important to have this information because it fills a gap that nationally we have where we don't really know what contributions people's gardens, people's households make to nectar provision for um, insect pollinators in the UK. Every Flower Council has had thousands and thousands of people and hundreds of thousands of quadrats have, um, sampled across the country, and we would love to have you join in with this. As I say, this is one of the most accessible uh, ways into grassland monitoring that Plant Life offers, and it's a great way to get to know the meadows that you have around your house as well. At the other end of the spectrum, somewhat in accessibility, but also in the rigor and the application of the data is the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, NPMS. Now, this is part of a national scheme that um, is a partnership. You can see in the top right-hand corner of that little infographic there with a lot of different organizations, some of them uh, closely linked to the UK government and different agencies therein. And it is designed to give us a national overview of what plant communities are doing, to give us a habitat health check on the um, the UK's different habitats, woodlands and grasslands around the country. It was launched after several years of consultation and piloting and refinement in 2015. So we've got six full years of data um, coming in. And we are very fortunate that we have many, many citizen scientists who take part and give us information about locations near them. It is the only scheme in the UK that has information on plant abundance through time. There are no others that have this kind of data. Um, you heard Lucia talk about how you can look at presence and absence. We have plenty of data on that. Um, we have some very, very sporadic schemes that have happened about five times since the 70s that have looked at plant abundance. But the National Plant Monitoring Scheme has happened every or well, twice a year, spring and summer, for the last six, now almost seven years, to give us that important data as to what is happening to the UK's meadows and grassland habitats. The process for it is a bit more involved, as you might expect, than every flower counts. Uh, you can sign up and you can choose yourself a one by one kilometre square that helps to sample randomly across the UK. And within that, you um, can get given locations and then you have to set up a fixed in grasslands five by five metre plot. Uh, you measure it out with sticks um, and then you can start to do your counting. 
Now, if you sign up for NPMS, or if you're already a member of NPMS, then you already know um, a little bit more about this, but there are some fantastic resources available on the NPMS support YouTube channel. If you're unsure if this is the kind of thing you want to get involved in, then head there and have a look. It will give you a fantastic overview of how accessible this can be and ways to do it well, as well as the value of this data set. So you can set up your five by five meter plot in a grass and area, and then you simply survey what's there. Now, here we've got uh, examples of paper recording forms. We do also have a very fancy app that lots of people are using and increasingly so. Um, but essentially you can choose, depending on your level of confidence, experience and ability, what level you want to record your square, your plot at. You can record at the simplest level, which is wildflowers, where there's a subset of the easier to identify um, most characteristic species and you can figure out which ones of those you have available you can look use the domin scale that you heard about earlier to work out how abundant they are within your square your plots and then you can send us that data you could uh, use a slightly larger even more useful list of indicator species uh, for every habitat in the npms we have about 30 indicators some positive and some negative like nettle which you were just hearing about now and those indicator species help to give us a good idea as to the health of the habitats that you're surveying. There is also an even more advanced level where if you are really quite skilled as a botanist, you can take part at the inventory level where you identify every plant growing in your plot and send us that data. That is an absolute gold standard of data that we can use to do all sorts of interesting things. Now, the NPMS was set up to be this kind of national sentinel scheme where we can understand in a statistically rigorous way changes in plant communities around the UK. Um, so if you got involved in the scheme as a volunteer, then you could choose um, a one kilometre square that's been um, set up to sample the UK's habitat gradients really nicely. You register, you can send you resources, you can take part in all the online support, which has been absolutely fantastic for the last couple of years. And the data you provide feed into UK-wide data and statistics. It helps to give us that really good fine-grained understanding of what is happening to habitats in the UK. And I'm going to see a little bit more about that um, on another webinar on data and conservation on, I think, the 25th. However, we're also developing another way of getting involved in the NPMS um, in a scheme called NPMS Plus, which is not part of that Sentinel scheme, that main um, UK wide statistically rigorous one, but in which you can apply the NPMS methods in your own land, in your own meadow, um, wherever you want to do that. We're setting up um, a scheme. Uh, resource called plant portal into which you can upload your data so it's part still of these national databases of plant records but you don't have to do it on these carefully selected squares and um, that scheme hasn't been launched yet it's still in the pilot method with um, partners from national trust to national parks but in the next year or two um, you should be able to take part in that so from every flower counts at the very accessible end of the spectrum that you can do in your garden with your kids, all the way up to NPMS, which would suit the most advanced botanists, there are a range of things that you can do to sample your wildflower areas. And I'm going to hand back over now to Lucia so she can talk to you a little bit about rapid grassland assessments. Thank you, Oli. Uh, so I'll just jump straight into the uh, last method um, that we mentioned. Let me just change the slide. Uh, so rapid grassland assessment. Um, it's a monitoring technique to monitor your um, grassland condition. So it's really um, ideal for those that are just starting their restoration journey, uh, just starting to create their own meadow um, and kind of getting feedback on how your restoration is going, how, it, how is it doing, how many flowers are appearing, is your diversity increasing? Um, it's done on a regular basis. You either do it once a year or um, every year. And it's really kind of best suited for um, a slightly larger gardens possibly, but really well suited for fields because um, you are aiming to place the 20 to 30 quadrats on. So this is this is to be placed in your own field to track your own restoration progress. Um, and it's really good to detect the kind of short term changes and the instant feedback. Um, 
there are templates available. There is um, kind of like a protocol that uh, that you can download that tells you all about how to carry out the survey. And part of it is a is a template. So you do have um, kind of examples of different indicator species there for a few different grassland um, types. But really, uh, this is a bit of a bespoke survey. So you you will need to cater it slightly towards your own field and what plants you might want there or you, or you already have. You place your quad quadrats across your site, 20 to 30 repetitions, I record your own data in the field um, on in your form. So you're looking at different positive and negative indicators, uh, seeing whether they are appearing in your quadrats. And uh, also for each of the quadrats, you note down some of these habitat characteristics that we talked about, like uh, um, how much grass is there, is there any scrub. And then uh, you analyze your own results. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, this is a bespoke survey. So there are species lists available in the protocol, uh, which you can use to kind of create your own template, but really it's meant for individual uh, meadows. And because every meadow is quite different, even within each meadow, you might have transitional habitats as well, that you might have uh, some species that are uh, characteristic for a bit more of a wet um, meadow, some some dry. Uh, you might want to be doing your, you know, creating your meadow specifically for insects. So if you are uh, aiming for having as many different uh, plants there, um, or if you are aiming to have a specific plant there, you might want to add it into your, into your um, uh, templates. So, so this really is a bespoke survey. So there are can, there are templates that you can build on, but it needs to be catered for your site. Um, and I will be doing another webinar on this on Monday. Actually, I think it's the one at two o'clock. Uh, so if you just check the program for Spring into Action again, and uh, if you are interested in knowing more about specifically, this will be specific on a rapid grassland assessment session where where I'll be. Uh, talking uh, you through how to form, how to analyze your own data and what does it all mean. And really, I think Oli did already a really amazing kind of comparison and uh, pointed out the strengths of, of the methods that he was talking about. So I'm not going to dwell on this very much because also it's quite hard to kind of compare them. They are not like one better than the other. They just have different strengths and are used in for different uh, aims, really. But the main strengths of every flower counts is if you are a gardener or if you've got a family community, you would just like to kind of get into uh, the uh, recording, learn some new flowers, uh, and you get the instant results in uh, in the form of your nectar score. Uh, then that's uh, that's the right uh, rapid grassland assessment. If you are thinking about starting off your meadow. Uh, or if you already are starting your meadow and just don't really want a bit of a feedback on how it's going, this is the really good technique that um, you can be using. Uh, National Plant Monitoring Scheme, um, again, as Oli mentioned, is really ideal for anyone that would like to join in with this amazing countrywide uh, scheme and feed into the national statistics, which are so super important to know about our grassland habitats. So that's just a very quick overview of those three. Um, and yes, yeah, we mentioned Monday's rapid grassland assessment on the 25th. Uh, Oli is going to be talking a bit more about the national plan monitoring scheme. Uh, we'll be running also in uh, in-person workshops on rapid grassland assessment. This is across Wales as a part of my project. And if you are interested in the training for national plan monitoring scheme, look at their website, please. Um, and I think that's all questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia, and thanks, Ollie. I'm just um, switching myself back on. <laughs> Be with us in a sec. That's great. So thank you both for a really informative um, and interesting presentation. We've had lots of great comments in the chat and lots and lots of questions. Um, so we'll do our best to answer some of them here. Um, if there's any that we don't answer, um, then please feel free to get in touch with us directly. You can email the team at meadowscumry at plantlike.org.uk and we'll do our best to um, get back to you. So yeah, well, I'll give you both a moment to pause. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna look at the Q&A now and see what kind of questions we've got coming in. 
while we are going through the questions, um, if you do have any feedback from today's session, please feel free to um, pop that in the chat for us as well, and we, we can take a look after. That's great. Okay, so um, I'll start if it's okay with the first question. So I'll just send this out to both of you and feel free to jump in. Um, so Sharice said, uh, would you always recommend introducing yellow rattle into meadow reseeding? Um, this is more of a habitat management, a grassland management question, I guess, rather than monitoring. So I might not spend so much on it because it's, it's not entirely the topic of today. And if you want specific management questions, there are also sessions coming up on how to create a mini meadow and how to create a meadow on a larger scale uh, over the next week. So please do join those. But very quickly, uh, it all depends on um, how much grass you've got. If your area is super, super lush, and growing with tons of grass, yes, you might want to introduce yellow rattle just to uh, keep on top of that grass first and might want to actually wait for a couple of years before you bring in some of your other wildflower seeds because they might be just completely swamped by grass. If you don't have that much grass, then there might not be um, need for yellow rattle, uh, but yellow rattle is an amazing plant in itself anyway for pollinators, so you might as well. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, and then Lisa um, has got a question saying, where can um, she find out more about indicator species? I don't know if there's any links or anything that we could perhaps point, point her to. Well, the NPMS does have some resources that look at indicator species. Um, they're not necessarily, um, well, they're, they're sort of restricted to NPMS level habitats, but that includes plenty of grass and ones. Um, and as I said, I think there's about 30 for each one. So that can give you a good idea as to um, which ones are positive and negative indicators. And I think you should find on the NPMS website um, some identification guides uh, and that kind of thing, which could be pretty helpful. That's great. Just to um, quickly add to that, if you if you are after the end of official uh, species lists for um, for our UK habitats inventory, if you look at the priority habitat, um, should be able to find it. This would be usually uh, under the kind of governmental website. So Nat Natural England is going to have uh, species lists that are characteristic species for uh, specific habitat. So if you look for priority habitat inventories. That's great. Thanks very much both. Um, so I've got a uh, question here from Charles. Um, so his parents own a field in Mid Wales. Um, it's got lots of different species, including knapweed, birds foot trefoil and achelia. Um, so asking if there's any idea of how this should be classified and how to monitor and maintain it. And um, it's currently being grazed by cattle um, in the winter time. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I got the uh, crux of the question, uh, but if if it's a field that you would like to um, change into a bit more diverse field, or if you are currently working on it as, a, as your meadow habitat, uh, then rapid grassland assessment might be a good technique, because that, that's a technique that you can apply on your own field to be able to monitor the plants that are already there and how they are doing. Uh, of course, with the new uh, national plant monitoring scheme kind of landowner option, uh, you will be also able to place a square of uh, for MPMS in your field and also at the same time um, can contribute towards the kind of national trends. So you could use both of those techniques. That's great. Um, so we've got lots and lots of questions flying in um, at the moment. So I'm just having a look here. Um, so uh Leslie's got a question um for local community organizations um that are taking part in the every flower count survey um, and inputting data um they want to know where um whether they could access that data and um, just to sort of see the difference they're making so I guess it's a question as to what happens with that data and is that kind of shared sort of publicly or where that goes to um, so that is something I've been working on for the last couple of weeks, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's very much happening now uh, on that screen on my computer. Um, so the we, we've had a little bit of a reshuffle in how we're analysing and working with the uh, Every Flower Counts data between last year and this. Uh, there'll be headline results for Every Flower Counts uh, getting released to the public in sort of April in advance of the uh, May survey window this time around. But we would really like to make it easy for people to access results uh, for their own lawns from previous years, um, but also to be able to give more aggregated uh, postcode level or village level or whatever um, 
kind of data to people. Um, for the time being, it's probably best uh, to email if that's something you want to kind of lodge um, and get in in advance. Um, I, having answering this question, I think there was an email about that that I still need to answer. Um, but it's certainly something we can do. It's not super difficult. Um, and yes, I, I don't think it's going to be publicly available for you to kind of download the numbers from a website. I don't think that's in the planning at the moment. But in terms of getting some sort of locally relevant numbers, absolutely, that's something we can do. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so just again, we've got some more flying in. Uh, so I'm just having a look at this one. So we've got another question on rapid grassland assessment um, from Fiona. So she started using the assessment on um, the local verges to see if the cutting regime, um, which is currently used for hay, is helping to result in producing more flowers. Um, but seeing the difference from year to year or presenting the results in an understandable way is proven a little bit difficult. So she's asking for a bit of advice in terms of, is there a good way of producing this change over the years and being able to kind of see, see that change um, mm -hmm. herself? Okay, so this this just kind of, I guess, comes down to the um, analyzing your own data. So this part of the monitoring um, does need a bit of a bit of a training, I guess. It's it's not super complicated. It's it's quite simple stuff that you need to do. You can just do them on your Excel sheet, really, very simply. But for this, I would really um, suggest joining the session on Monday because I will be going through all of that in real detail on exactly how you go through your form and how you can pull out those numbers and those um, in interesting facts that you might want to know for your verges. But it's great to hear that it's been used on verges. Um, and I've just, just on rapid grassland assessment, I have put the link in the chat, but I'm just gonna put the link in again and to people in terms of um, a research, quite a few, we've had quite a few questions in about asking for um, a list of resources for that. So I've just popped that in the chat for everybody. Um, so I think we've probably got time for one more. So we've got, um, Christina's asked, um, she's got a three acre hay meadow, um, and she's asking if, if we, if we know, um, how many sample plots would we recommend for, for a sort of, um, field of that scale and size? Um, I guess it depends on what technique we are used talking about as well. So with the NPMS, I believe it's just one uh, one square in a, in an area that's fixed, and you'll revisit it uh, every time. But if you were talking about graphic graph assessment, we suggest a minimum of twenty squares if you've got a larger site. So if you've got a few acres at least 20 squared if you can do 30 that's great because the more you do the more accurate your data is but it will always come down to um, your time constraints as well because it does take time it might take half a day to carry out 30 um, squares or even longer depending on how confident you are in your ids so 20 to 30 uh, aim for 30 if you can great thanks very much um, and I guess we'll sneak one last question in because um, we just had so many. Um, so Caroline has asked, um, what do what do you can what do you both consider the most challenging feature in uh, analyzing and monitoring meadows? So kind of what are the most common mistakes or I guess rookie errors that that we make? And are there any um, sort of things that we can suggest to that, that, that are good places to start that we haven't already covered? I know that's a bit of a tricky question. <laughs> um, Oli, did you want to take that one? <laughs> You've got more of a kind of oh. uh, <laughs> just to throw that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think my perspective on it would probably come most from analysing the data and thinking about uh, potential blind spots in that. Mm -hmm. And one of them would be. Uh, so thinking about NPMS, and we've got those three different participation levels. Uh, the only one in which uh, grasses themselves are counted, I think, is the inventory level. I don't think uh, grass plants are counted or identified under wildflower or um, indicator species level. And so obviously in grasslands, that's a very, very large gap in um, what you understand. And I, I think part of that also is um, about the ease or difficulty of identifying species that may or may not be in flower at any given point. Um, so for, for me, and again, this from a sort of data analysis point of view, thinking about what is and is not easy to survey, what does and does not come out in the data, I think those would be some of the things I think about. Um, but I'm sure if um, 
if I were a better field botanist, I'd have very different uh, views on that and I'd be able to give you a different perspective. Oh, that's great. <laughs> just very quickly, just jump in one sentence. Mm -hmm. um, don't be uh, scared, I, I would say. I know it can kind of seem like it's quite complicated, uh, but please don't, don't be discouraged by the forms. Just have a go at it because it's not as complicated as it might seem. And it's a lot of fun as well. You will learn uh, lots of different types of flowers and grasses and yeah, kind of get a bit of a handle on the, on the science behind it as well. So it, uh, it's, it can be very informative. And, oh, thank you both. And yes, yeah, sorry for firing so many questions at you. But um, yes, we've had lots and lots of questions, lots of comments and lots of lovely feedback as well. So thank you to everyone. Thanks to everyone that's attended today. Um, and as Lucia and Ollie have said, we've got quite a few interesting sessions coming up. So all of those can be found on our Plant Life um, website and also on our social media channels. Do um, keep an eye on those because they, they're the kind of most up to date in terms of what we've got coming up. So thanks again, everybody. Um, this is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the YouTube um, channel shortly after, after the end of the programme. So yes, thanks again and have a great afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Mm -hmm.